product spaces. And that we get to the more interesting part of today's lecture, which is connectivity. And uh, we'll mostly motivate today. So, and define thing, define connectivity. So, the main question is, when does the intermediate value theorem holds? And what what is the intermediate value theorem states? It's a, I mean, if we wanted to state in a metric space, so. Well, we have a function x to r. It, there are two points in the space, one where it's less than c, another where it's bigger than c. So we would like to say that there exists a point where the function is equal to c. So the classical picture that we all know is an uh, interval x is equal to a, b, and uh, f of a is less than c f of b is bigger than c. So this is a is our x, b is our c, uh, y. But in a general case, we don't have distinguished endpoints, so we don't want to give them too big meaning. And then we are looking for solutions to equations uh, fc is equal to 1 to c. So we want to generalize the domain into something else than an inter interval. But we, initially, we quickly run into problems is that we have to place assumptions on the, I mean, this doesn't hold for all functions. It doesn't hold for all metric spaces. So we have to place assumptions that guarantee these solutions to exist. And we have to understand what they mean. So first is that, of course, F has to be continuous. I mean, the initial, uh, even in the interval case, without continuity, everything breaks apart. Suppose you have a function that's one, on the rational numbers minus one on the irrational numbers. Obviously, intermediate value property is not true. So IVT does not hold for F, obviously. Yeah. On the interval, say, zero, one. Or, well, not zero, yeah. On a general interval. Of course, if you take a rational endpoint interval, then f will be constant one, so it doesn't really help at the endpoints. So we need more. Okay, so we need continuity, but we also need more. And to see that, this is again a phenomenon that already occurs in real line, so we don't need to go very far to see that these issues come up. Namely, if we take a union of two intervals and take that as our x, and this is just like on the exam, is that okay? Even though there we there are is this stuff that we could imagine between we forget about it. X is the entire space with the restricted distance. There are no points outside of it, except in our imagination. Uh, so now, okay, we have a function f, and I will define it as follows. So it will equal one uh, when x is in zero one and zero when x is in two three. Now this function again does not satisfy the intermediate value theorem because if it never attains the value half. So here no solution to f of z is equal to half despite that f of zero is equal to one, and f of three, say, is equal to zero. And, well, we could ask what is happening in this example, and what example, what should be, what assumption should be placed? And we quickly hone in on the idea, the crucial idea here is that there's something missing there. But that's not a very sustainable definition if you want to speak in high generalities uh, to say that there's just something missing. So we need other notions. And the notion that we kind of need is that what it's trying to capture, and it's to, one could argue a little bit whether it succeeds in it, but 
the idea is that, okay, you have your continuous function. In nice cases, at least, what we want is the common idea of connectivity. That the space should not consist of two separate blobs or two separate intervals in our example, but somehow there should be a way of going from X to Y, vaguely speaking. We'll make it precise on Wednesday. But if there is a way of going from X to Y, then you could think that, okay, you have this one dimensional thing that looks like an interval. F of X is less than zero, say. F of Y is bigger than zero. So on this segment, there should be some point where F of Z is equal to zero. I mean, this is the kind of the idea of the scheme. Unfortunately, this is not the definition that we will give. So it's very sort of, it comes, at least the picture is very suggestive that somehow we are looking for ways of connecting the pair of points. Uh, of course, there's many issues here that I haven't defined what it means to connect. I haven't defined curve. I said the word one dimensional without defining it. So lots of things that I haven't defined. So uh, our goal is to find the assumptions that define this. And, uh, and what we will be, what eventually we'll prove on Wednesday is that, okay, if it's F is continuous and if we have this mysterious notion of connectivity, then intermediate value theorem holds as we stated. And you can think of the picture as an example of a connected set. Other examples that you can think of are balls in, our, in the plane or disks in the plane. And these kind of pictures are mostly enough for practical applications. Now, why I say this is that um, the unfortunate thing about continuity is that the, uh, connectivity is that it has a very unintuitive definition. Uh, so we, our discussion and our examples above, they indicated that some sense of what we're looking for. We're, for IVT, we're looking for some idea of connectivity. It should have something to do with paths in a space. Uh, but it turns out that that notion is not very practical or convenient to use. So this leads to actually another definition that's much more abstract up to the point that you completely might lose the intuition of what it means, except that you have to remember that it really comes from these pictures. But the good thing that it has and why we're doing it is that it is actually, while it is less intuitive to use, it is actually much more powerful to use. And much after you get used to it, it becomes much easier to use as well for certain applications. It's hard to prove, but it's uh, easier to use. And what this condition is capturing is uh, an, sort of another way that it's trying to express it is that returning to our picture of an interval, an interval should be connected. If it's not connected, we've failed. So we have our point X and we have our point Y. Now, why is there a point where the function is equal to zero? Uh, say zero if f of x is zero, uh, say less than zero, and f of y uh, is one, uh, or is it bigger than zero. Well, one way of saying it is that if we look at the values where f x, all the values f of z, which are less than zero, and well, you, we're only interested in the interval, but then they define some set. X is inside the set. Y is outside the set. And another way of saying that there is this point is that there is a transition where the function goes from negative to positive. So it, there's an x-intercept. But if we massage that even more, then we notice that there has to be a boundary and that this 
set or this curve has to pass through the boundary. So we get the problem really becomes is does a non-empty subset A of R space X have boundary not empty? Or when does it have? So the idea of connectivity is intimately connected to boundaries. And this is where the definition that we will use comes. And uh, so we could ask, when does it have a boundary point? And you can characterize this. So if you have a subset of X, then the following are equivalent. And think this time it's easier to state things for the contrapositive or the negation. So if there are no boundary points, then you can say that the set is both closed and open. And uh, because complements behave nicely with closed and open, that means the same thing as the complement being closed and open. So let's quickly walk through this proof. We are, we'll return to this on uh, Wednesday. At least I'll just discuss the one part, A through B. The other ones are written here and I'll discuss on Wednesday. So, well, what does it, if A, A means that we know that the boundary is empty. Let's use definitions of closeness that involve the boundary. Well, A is closed if the boundary is contained in A. Well, the boundary of A is empty. So since the empty subset of A, any set, then the boundary of A is a subset of A. So A is closed. The empty set being the boundary. Now, A is open if A intersects with the boundary is empty. But, well, boundary of A is empty, so it intersected with anything else certainly is empty as well. So, A is open. So, I mean, this proofs look weird, but the idea is that this, this terminology, the way it's defined, is really capturing the set being closed and open is somehow related the boundary being empty, and it comes directly from the definitions. You put up. Now, B and C, they're basically, you go from the to the complements, again, using theorems that we have in our class shown. And going from C to A, again, uses the definitions by boundaries. Well, uh, but I won't say anything about that now because I want to state the definition in the very least and state a theorem before our time is up. So now with all this in mind, and it takes a while to get used to this idea, a set X is connected. If for any pair of open sets, then if X is a union of two, those two open sets, then either U or V is open. Now, how does this connect to what we just said, because it looks a little weird, is that lemma X is connected if and only if the only open and closed subsets are the empty set and the full space. I mean, those sets are always open and closed. Uh, but in connected spaces, the only sets without boundary are those without any points at all, or those points that have every single point in the space. So missing boundary means the same thing as open and closed, which in connected spaces means that you are everything or nothing. And how this connect, why the, we have here U and V is that, well, U is equal to V complement in this case. So U would be open and closed and V would be open and closed. So this definition really should be thought of as saying, that if you have open and closed subset in your space, then the only possibility is that they are everything or nothing. So in this statement, it's possible for one of these sets to be empty. And that's crucial to remember. So remark, usually 
uh, you or, well, in a connected space. Either you or the must be empty. And where does this come from? It comes from the disjointness. Okay. So this is an abstract definition. Uh, we'll discuss more of these proofs. But the first main theorem that I want to state at least is that the interval is a connected space. Everything else will basically be based on this statement. Now, I won't discuss the proof now, but if you came on Thursday, if you were on Thursday, or if you looked through the practice problems last week for the exam, then you will see that this proof is actually very similar to those problems. And actually all of our discussion now is very similar to that discussion about what sets are open and closed and what sets to have empty boundary. So uh, the proof, what it essentially the main tool will be soup of A. Because soup of A kind of, soup of A and inf of A, they have to belong to the boundary of A, usually. Now in a bounded set like the interval, you have to bit worry about the endpoints and that leads to some technicalities that we will discuss then Wednesday.